All right. Welcome, everybody, to our show. As always, I'm Dr. Sean Hashmi. This is selfprinciple.org, sleep, exercise, love, and food, where we always try to make a difference in people's life. I think education is such a powerful thing. And the more we can learn to take control of our lives, the better off we are. And every time we have a guest, you know, I get so excited, but rarely do I get people on the show who are such pioneers, not just in the terms of knowledge and so forth, but in terms of action, in terms of what they're doing to change the world. So I have one of the most interesting stories to talk about today, and I'm delighted to have Ocean Robbins. So Ocean, welcome to our show. Well, thank you so much, Sean. I'm thrilled to be with you. This is this is such a treat for me because, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I didn't I didn't know all of the amazing work you were doing. And we have a mutual friend who was Abel Benjamin Ha. Uh, he's a physician. He's such a great friend of mine and all around just an absolute terrific guy. We're going to have him on the show coming up. But he was the one that kind of connected us. Yes, it, I'm glad he did. Yeah. So let me ask you, because I, I got a chance to read a little bit about you, but you have the most fascinating history. And, you know, Ocean Robbins. And, you know, it took me a, a, a while and then I, I clicked and I said, wow, that's the story. So I don't want to take any thunder away. Let me ask you <laughs> to kind of tell me a little bit about you. Sure. So uh, family history here. My grandpa founded a little ice cream company that became a not so little ice cream company. It was called Baskin Robbins. And my dad, John, grew up with an ice cream cone shaped swimming pool in the backyard and 31 flavors of ice cream in the freezer he was groomed to one day join in running the family company. But when he was in his early 20s, he was offered that chance. And he said, nope, not for me. He, he chose to walk away from a path of immense wealth to, as we jokingly say in our family, follow his own rocky road. <laughs> he ended up uh, moving with my mom to a little island off the coast of Canada, where they built a one-room log cabin. They grew most of their own food. They practiced yoga and meditation for several hours a day. And they named their kid Ocean. And the truth is, they almost named me Kale. And this was before <laughs> Kale was cool. But we did eat a lot of Kale and cabbage and carrots and other veggies from the garden. And when I got a little older, my family moved to California. My dad began researching the food industry he'd grown up in. And he ended up coming out with a book in 1987. It was called Diet for a New America. And it inspired millions of people to look at their food choices as a chance to make a difference on the planet. And one of his readers, as fate would have it, ended up being my grandpa, Urban Robbins, who was practically on death's door. He'd always eaten the standard American diet. Now he had the standard American diseases. He had heart disease, he had obesity, he had diabetes, and he'd already lost his brother-in-law and business partner to, Bert, to, uh, to uh, a heart attack when my dad's uncle, Bert Baskin, was 54. Wow. So my grandpa was in this situation. His doctor said, look, Mr. Robbins, you're a very sick man. And if you want to live, you better change your diet. And they give him a copy of Diet for New America. Now, this was back in the days when not a lot of doctors talked about food and health. So he was lucky to have one of the few who, like you, got it, right? And um, so ended up that uh, my grandpa followed its advice. He gave up sugar. He gave up ice cream. He cut way down on his animal product consumption in meat and dairy, started eating a lot more whole plant foods, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds and legumes, and he got results. He reversed his diabetes. He reversed his heart disease. He lost a bunch of weight. His golf game improved seven strokes, and he ended up living another 19 more powerfully healthy years. So we really have seen in our family, when we follow the standard American diet, we end up on the path to the standard American diseases, but we've also seen that we can make a change and turn things around. And in my own personal life, I was inspired both by my, my grandpa's business achievements, but also by his courage to be willing to make a change. And that really flew in the face of what he built his career on because he had to listen to his renegade son and he had to admit there was a connection between diet and health, which was not something he really wanted to think about before, but he was willing to do that because he wanted to live. And I was also inspired by my dad's example of making a big impact on the planet and saying that some things are more important in life than money. And so when I was 16, I founded a nonprofit organization and I 
worked with young leaders in 65 countries, focusing on leadership development, peace, human rights, sustainability, social justice, and helping young people to be agents of positive impact in their communities. And as I traveled the globe, I kept seeing that everybody eats and that all over the world, the American way of producing food with big agribusiness, factory farms, pesticides, GMOs was spreading, and that the American way of processing and marketing food was spreading with KFC and McDonald's and Baskin Robbins and all of this was spreading. And as this was happening all over the world, as countries got wealthier, waistlines were expanding, hospitals were filling up and people were getting sick with diseases like cancer and heart disease and dementia that had been unheard of a generation or two before. And so I ended up deciding I better focus directly on food. And so in 2012, I left the nonprofit and I joined with my dad, now my colleague, in launching Food Revolution Network. And for the last almost decade now, we've been on a mission of healthy, ethical, sustainable food for all. We've reached millions of people and uh, frankly, we're just getting started. Well, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated about Food Revolution, the network itself, the website. Tell me a little bit about it. What is it about? What, what kind of impact are you guys seeing and what are you hoping to achieve with that? Well, our... The impact we're seeing is at the one level anecdotal because we hear from people literally daily uh, about how the food revolution has changed their life. Just today, I heard from a woman who had lost 90 pounds after she participated in one of our online summits. We hold summits every year that have reached over a million people at this point um, where we interview leading food experts and broadcast those messages to the world for free. And um, uh, I heard from another person just today who had uh, outlived her prognosis. Her, her She had been told she had months to live with cancer. It's now been four years. She's thriving and healthy. Heard from another person today who'd gotten off uh, heart disease meds that he no longer needs because wow. he changed his diet with one of our summits. So we hear these stories and it's like, wow, that's why we do this, right? Um, and then we also see the larger movement taking place. Um, and honestly, when I was a kid growing up, you couldn't find organic anything in supermarkets. You couldn't find uh, tofu or soy milk in supermarkets. You certainly couldn't find meatless burgers in market supermarkets. Nowadays, all that stuff is everywhere. In fact, you don't just have soy milk. You've got almond and hemp and oat milk and flax milk and, you yes. know, everything else, right? Um, uh, and so what we're seeing is that the marketplace is changing and there are vegetarian and vegan options in fast food restaurants now. And the number of Americans who identify as vegan has increased three or four fold, depending on the survey you look at in the last decade, since we started Food Evolution Network. A lot of factors are at play there, but I'd like to think we're part of that. We send out about a hundred million email messages a year sharing empowering messages with our email list. We produce Food Revolution Summits for 300,000 people annually. Um, we have online courses and training resources and a blog with, you know, 5 million unique visitors, I think every month right now. And we've got over a thousand articles up there sharing the latest insights about food and health. And here's the thing, uh, Sean, that I think is unique about our work. We, we focus on personal health, of course, because that's what motivates a lot of people. But we also look at food from a systemic perspective and we are interested in a revolution, functionally, a healthy revolution that empowers everybody to have access to healthy food for their families. We wanna remove the barriers. We, we, we don't think that eating whole foods should take your whole paycheck. We don't think that it's fair that statistically the poorer you are and the darker your skin color in the United States today, the more likely you are to suffer from chronic disease and to die a premature death because of lifestyle induced illness. And so we're very committed to getting this information out widely, empowering everybody to contribute to a world with healthy, ethical and sustainable food for all, not just for the elite few who happen to be able to tune in and pay an arm and a leg, but for everybody. So we're looking at what are the barriers to that and how can we mobilize our 700,000 members and all of our network of partners and affiliates to be able to actually make an impact on these issues. And that's, that's very dear to my heart. The nonprofit I directed was all about impact for 20 years. Now we're focusing on food, 
But ultimately, my goal is a healthy, thriving, prosperous, joyous world for everybody. And how can food be a means towards that greater end? Let me let me ask you, because this is such a fascinating topic. You know, when I, when I was growing up, and uh, so I grew up in an inner city, it was really hard. And I remember the stuff that I had access to was all fast food. Before yeah. I discovered what a whole foods plant-based diet was, it wasn't until the end of medical school that I even got some kind of an inkling towards nutrition. And that was just because I was interested and I was sick as a child. I had all these um, illnesses. And then growing up, all I did was eat McDonald's or Taco Bell or you name it. And when I learned about the impact of that, was so powerful that it really changed my life. But what I find now is with my patients, they know that they should eat more fruits and vegetables, but they don't. They know it, but taking that basic knowledge of, hey, this is really bad for us. Forget taking the planet away for a second because it's such an important part, but even being selfish and saying, I'm putting this stuff in my body. What do you find? are the barriers, and I'm always curious of this, what do you think are the barriers that are preventing people from knowing and doing the right thing? Well, there are several. One is habit, just straight up what you're used to, right? And the good news there is that taste buds actually change and habits can actually change. And, you know, a lot of us are on autopilot most of the time. We think of ourselves as having free will, and to an extent we do. But uh, what happens when your brain is turned off and when you're focused on something else is actually more often what shapes your destiny because it's those things you do day in and day out that are just engrooved that that really make all the difference. And so the right use of willpower, I think, is to create new habits. And then like water, which flows in grooves that eventually become gullies and creeks and rivers, uh, your habits are similar. And so when you create the habits that cause the water to flow, cause the norm to change, then eventually it's easy. I don't struggle to eat healthy food because it's what I've been doing my whole life, right? So it's not hard, but change can be hard, especially when you're fighting habit. And so the key thing is learning how to create those groups on a personal level. And then there's economic barriers. And so we look at Systemically, we have taxpayer subsidies in the US that go to commodities crops, tens of billions of dollars a year in taxpayer subsidies that are, at the end of the day, they're bringing down the price of high fructose corn syrup and white bread and factory farmed meat. And they're not supporting fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds, which are the things we should be eating more of. And so we are looking at calling for changes in the subsidy system so that if we're going to subsidize anything, let's subsidize healthy food for low-income communities. And then we also have large-scale food industry that is focused on making the biggest buck. And right now, I mean, I've talked with leaders at Nestle and Unilever and Coca-Cola and a lot of these other brands, and they don't stay up all night trying to figure out how to create products that will make our kids fat and sick. They're just trying to make ends meet and they won't do anybody any good if every company that does the right thing goes out of business. So we have to create economic incentives for these companies to shift. And all of them have missions. They all want their products to make the world better. And unfortunately, they're a little bit heads in the sand about what's actually happening right now because they have a large economic incentive not to see what it's really doing to us and to the health of our communities. But I believe that if we can create an economic incentive in another direction, that will shift. So partly that's consumer level, partly that's organizations like ours and, you know, larger entities focusing on calling out the folks that are that are doing things that are destructive and helping create some incentive to shift. Um, And then, um, you know, we also have barriers that come from the medical system, with all due respect, often acting like food didn't matter because it, there's this focus on drugs and surgery and uh, not a lot of focus on food and health. And it's my personal belief that if, if, if there was reimbursement for broccoli, like there's re- reimbursement for chemo, we'd see more broccoli prescribed. And frankly, we'd see less chemo prescribed because we'd see less need for it. So that's where one of my passions is produce prescription programs where doctors can prescribe vegetables and patients actually get it reimbursed 
and then it's covered and then they have a big incentive to do what their doctor told them to do. And their doctor has an incentive to tell them to do it because it's authorized and it's approved and it's standard practice. And I also wanna see double up bucks program for the SNAP program so that food stamp recipients get double value for fruits and vegetables. This is being piloted for about 500,000 Americans right now and it's showing tremendous promise. Let's take that nationwide so all 50 million people who tragically depend right now for food stamps and government support to feed their families, let's at least help them to do the right thing for their families and feed their families the right food by creating economic incentive to go towards healthier directions. If we do that, both of those things can uplift our most vulnerable populations, the people who are struggling and hurting the most right now by giving them fundamentally free access to fruits and vegetables. At the end of the day, that will create a circle that will help them be healthier. And it will also lift on a generational level, it will list, lift our hardest hit communities out of poverty. We know right now that medical costs are the leading cause of bankruptcy in the United States right now. And the people who can least afford it are the sickest. So then they're unable to work at their best, they're unable to be productive, and they end up dying in a mountain of debt rather than being able to pass something on to the next generation. So this is how we create intergenerational cycles of poverty or how we turn it around. And this is why I'm so passionate as somebody who wants to see everybody have the ability to provide for their families. I want everyone to have the ability to have health. You know, what, what you have just said is so powerful. And I think people need a second just to, to think about this. I mean, in my practice, I see patients who basically lose their kidneys. And the number one reason why they lose it is diabetes, type two diabetes, not type one, yeah. a type of diabetes that's due to lifestyle, that's due to eating. And when you look at these folks, there's nothing bad about them. Just one thing that we see more often than not is their level of income. The lower the level of income, the higher the likelihood they're going to end up on dialysis. And it's all because of these intermediaries that are obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, all that are lifestyle related. So it's such a powerful thing that you talk about. And in, in my own experience dealing with a lot of physicians, our physicians, one of the things that they're challenged with is in a 10-minute appointment, in a 15-minute appointment, the number of checkboxes, you know, we talk about electronic health records as being good. It is so cumbersome to get through. And what patients are really looking for is, is if you start to have that conversation around food, you know, I get patient complaints because they say, look, you know, Dr. Hashmi did not give me a drug. Well, that's because I want you to fix your eating. The drug will come, but fix your eating right? You can't build a house if you don't have a foundation. Let's get the foundation right. So let right. me ask you this question. You mentioned economic incentives for companies. What are some things that could happen on that bigger scale that can drive these companies to do better decisions? Well, certainly from a retailer perspective, if we had the double up bucks program, then 7-Eleven and all the corner grocery stores and all the supermarkets and low-income communities would suddenly see a surge in demand for fruits and vegetables, right? Because people get double value for them, so they're gonna wanna buy more of them, which is gonna change what's stocked in those stores, which is going to create um, an end or help to end food deserts, right? Because it changes the game. So that's one thing that could happen. Um, and then secondly, um, as more people get informed about food and health, then suddenly companies feel more on the hook for their products and their ingredient lists, and they start to make changes. And we are seeing that some of the major food brands are starting to change their, they're making shorter ingredient lists with less chemicals and additives, less added sugar, for example. And we could go further, we could actually start to have more intensive labeling, for example, we could look at the environmental impact of products and start to have a scoring. For example, the carbon impact. And if we have third-party valid legitimate studies with researchers who are peer-reviewed and their focus is on the data, and we start to look at what is the carbon impact of different foods, and then we start to have a simple score on every product, 
that tells people what the carbon impact is. Obviously, you never know. It depends how the tomato was growing, right? Or how the cow was growing. It's, it's, it's not just the cow, it's the how. But at the end of the day, what you start to see is there, there, we could have metadata that feeds into that. And uh, you would see consumer behavior, I think, start to shift. Because here's the thing, people want to do the right thing. And studies tell us over and over again, people are willing to pay extra for food that's healthier for them and healthier for their planet. You know, nobody wants to be, for example, funding child labor when they buy chocolate. But half the world's chocolate comes from Ivory Coast in Ghana, where there are millions of kids enslaved or not in school because they're being forced to grow chocolate to feed their families or because their overlords force them to. And so I say, you know what? I want any chocolate I ever eat and chocolate's a wonderful food, but I want any chocolate I ever eat to come from farmers who are paid enough to feed their own families and have a roof over their heads without having to force their kids into labor at the age of seven. And uh, cause no parent wants their kids to be out there laboring in the fields. They do it for survival, right? No one, no parent wants to sell their kids into slavery but it happens for survival. And so I'm saying, you know what, Nestle, Mars, Hershey's, they've got some accountability here and they are long supply chains and they can hide behind that. But at the end of the day, when they say this must stop, they can change it, you know? And the reality is that they can have to raise the price of the chocolate bars by a few pennies a bar. But I don't think there are any, many, very many consumers when faced with that choice that wouldn't pay a few more pennies for their chocolate bar to not participate in that system. And mm -hmm. so this is an example of where I think ethics and social responsibility starts to need to get woven in somewhat. And I realize this is controversial. As, as an educator of sorts, I at least want to spread the word so that it's more visible to people so they can make educated choices. And for now, speaking of chocolate, you need to go with non-GMO, you need to go with fair trade, you need to go with organic if you want to stay out of that system. How, how do the average consumer who's trying to do the right thing, what are steps they can take right now to either go towards the direction of brands that are more transparent? Is there trusted sources to go or, or where does one start when their heart's in the right place as a consumer? Well, you look for obviously sourcing locally is wonderful. Farmers markets are wonderful. Small scale producers are wonderful. And then you look for certain labels. So organic is a really good one. Uh, fair trade, if it's coming from international, if you're dealing with chocolate or coffee or you know other goods that are shipped around the world obviously, and sugar too. But obviously, if you're looking for health, you're probably not eating a whole lot of sugar anyway. And then, uh, and even bananas, I mean, fair trade is really helpful. And then, um, you know, with, with animal products, if you're going to eat animal products, then you want to look for grass fed and pasture raised and organic certifications and humane certifications. Um, but keep in mind that even grass fed and pasture raised, you're still dealing with products that have no fiber, you're still dealing with products that have no phytonutrients and that are generally high in saturated fat, all of which are kind of negative. So at the end of the day, what I say is we need to eat less animal products across the board. And for those who are going to eat them, to whatever extent they eat them, we need to source from animals that were able to run around that saw the sun, that knew what a blade of grass was, and that got to live like animals should more rather than cooped up on and concrete in barns in close quarters, pumped full of antibiotics and hormones their whole lives, fed a totally unnatural diet and uh, being sort of protein factories in reverse because they're turning grain and soy and turning them into hoof and hide and bone and manure and energy they burn and heat and a little bit of flesh that humans then eat at tremendous waste. You know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating concept looking at animal production as one of the worst offenders when we talk about the environmental impact. But on the flip side, you know, one of the things that I find is, is there's so much information that, that people don't know where to begin. And what I tell them is, is just start. That's all that matters in life. You don't have to go save the world tomorrow. Make a change today. 
Let that change build and start another change. Have habits. That's why I love your concept that you started with, which was how do you start changes? It's this concept of how much autopilot we're on. Well, let's change that autopilot into a healthier version. So let me ask you, for people, because we always have people who watch the show who are either in the medical field or not, but they're ones that have not started and they're curious. For the curious people out there, how do you tell people that clearly come to you for advice and, and come to foodrevolution.org? Where do they start? Okay, so you start where you are and you look where you want to go. And the four core principles that I advocate are number one, eat less sugar and processed junk. Number two, eat less animal products, especially from factory farms. Number three, eat more whole plant foods, especially fruits and vegetables. And number four, practice conscious sourcing, which means focus on certified organic, certified fair trade, supporting local farms and, uh, and so forth, supporting companies that have values you believe in. And when we put those four together, you realize that every bite you take is essentially a vote. You're voting for the health you want and you're voting for the world you want. And instead of once a year at the ballot box, you're voting three times every day. And it makes a huge, huge, huge impact. And a lot of people say, oh my gosh, I've been eating this way my whole life. It's hard to make a change. And I say, yes, but, but the worse you've eaten so far, the more you have to gain from making a change. The key thing is this isn't a diet plan that you just go on for a couple of weeks and then slip back to your old ways. This is about creating healthy habits. And so I really want to help people lovingly lean into a healthier life one step at a time rather. And some people go cold turkey and that's awesome. But you can also add like one healthy meal a week, you know, from a really healthy whole foods, plant based recipe. Get to know it. Add it to your starting rotation. Try a few things and then have one new thing you make regularly. Switch from you know, skipping breakfast or eating nothing but, you know, sugary breakfast cereals or bacon and eggs and go to like oatmeal for breakfast, you know, um, you know, change out your dinner to add in some steamed vegetables. Try to get at least a couple cups of steamed vegetables every single day, you know, add those things in and you start to crowd out the bad stuff. And uh, so for some people, it really works to just go one step at a time. Other people want to go cold turkey. They throw out a bunch of stuff in the fridge. And, and that's where you'll get the dramatic results, of course, because if you're trying to watch your, you know, your blood pressure levels plummet and, you know, your, your diabetes reverse, if, you, if you're wanting to lose pounds quickly, then you want to go for a faster change. Um, but the bottom line is it's got to be thinking for the long haul. You've got to be oriented around that because it's not your aspirations. It's not your willpower that shapes your destiny. It's your habits. So creating those healthy habits and stepping into them is really critical. One other thing I'll add is that for a lot of people, sugar addiction is real and processed food addiction is real. And if you ever find yourself on the wrong end of an empty bag of cookies or chips late at night, if you ever find yourself obsessing about food or craving foods that are not in your best interests, then you may really need to go cold turkey with the stimuli because addiction is a real thing, just like an alcoholic can't have just one drink. Similarly, if you have addiction at any level to unhealthy foods, then drawing a sharp, bright line can be really important, particularly for the first month or so as you are developing new habits. And uh, I find, and we find that it's sugar and it's flour products that tend to trigger the dopamine hit in the brain to get people activated. So if you're in that camp, you may really need to say no to any added sugars and no to any flour products, at least for a month. You can still eat you know, your whole grains, but don't eat bread, for example. You know, don't eat pasta, for example, during that time. Don't eat pizza. Sorry to say it. Um, but here's the thing, folks. We know that people will do chemotherapy when their life's on the line. No one does that for fun. But when you want to live, when you realize what's at stake, people will do drastic things. So I want to invite people to live with that kind of urgency when it comes to a change in diet, because the standard American diet is toxic it will lead to an untimely death for most people. I mean, if you drive your car into a brick wall, the death certificate might say impalement by brick wall, but we all know it was really, you're driving, right? And 
Similarly, I don't know if you eat the standard American diet, whether you're going to get type 2 diabetes or obesity or heart issues or dementia uh, or have inflammation and autoimmune disorders or, or what will happen. But I can tell you that statistically, the odds are very good that one of those things is in your future. And the good news is that you can slash your risk of all of the major chronic illnesses of our times by making food the foundation of your health. And the other good news is that in time, your taste buds evolve. There are actually studies showing that when people eat kale, the first time it tastes bitter. And after about 10 times of eating kale in a relatively short period of time, their saliva changes and they produce certain enzymes and it actually tastes sweeter. It's not just in your mind, it's actually real. And so this is true also with your bacteria and your gut. When you feed the good guys with lots of fiber and healthy foods, you actually change the bacterial milieu in your gut and you start to crave different kinds of foods because the bacteria in your gut are the ones that like those foods. If you, if you feed them all sugar, then guess who propagates in your gut? It's the bacteria that like sugar. If you feed them all fiber, then that's what propagates in your gut is the bacteria that love that. And what we're learning more and more, which is just fascinating about the microbiome, is that our bacteria in our gut have a whole lot to do with how we think, how we feel, and what we want in our lives. If you ever have a gut instinct, well, guess what? The bacteria are working with you to create that awareness. Your gut is like your second brain. And so when you feed the good bacteria right, then suddenly your gut instincts will be more true and more wise, and they'll help to call you eventually towards drawn towards loving the foods that love you back. You know, it's, it's, it's such a fascinating thing that you talk about food addiction, which is one of the areas that I do a lot of research into. You know, when they do um, studies in mice, and it's very cruel to do these animal studies because you can predict the outcome. But what's, what's so devastating and heartbreaking to watch is you can have mice that you give them sugar water, and then you pair it with a shock. So every time they go for that sugar water, they get shocked. Yeah. They will not stop. Even though the shock is so severe, they will not stop. And if you take the sugar water away and you give them their regular food, they will actually starve themselves. Now, if you thought that only applies to animals that are caged and it happens and it doesn't happen to humans, we have dialysis patients where we, we know that their diabetes caused them to go on dialysis. Unfortunately, we have had to amputate their arms or amputate their legs. They may be blind in one eye. I had a patient who actually had both arms, both legs, one eye was blind, and he still could not give up his fast food, still couldn't yes. do it. Yes. Sugar addiction is so powerful. So it, it really is. As, as you think about this stuff, let me ask you, what does Food Revolution, your nonprofit that you guys have, what is sort of the projects that you guys are doing? Because, you know, I looked at it and I was so impressed, but I, I really want to kind of hear from you what you guys are working on. So we have our Food Revolution Summit. You can sign up at foodrevolutionsummit.org to join in. Any time of the year we create access. So we have an annual event and then the rest of the year people can register to sort of watch the replays. And, um, and then um, we also put out online courses. Um, we have one on brain health with Drs. Dean and Aisha Sherzai. We have one on called Plant Powered and Thriving that my dad and I put together. And uh, we have master classes where people can get free education and step into this and then learn more. So if you go to thriving.foodrevolution.org, you can sign up for the master class my dad and I put together. If you go to brain.foodrevolution.org, you can sign up for the one with the shares eyes. And we're working on more on heart health, on gut health and other topics. And, um, and then we also have an email list. And so we send out regular newsletters for our 700,000 members and we have a blog with a, probably over a thousand articles at this point on critical food and health topics. And we're always adding more. We add two new articles every week. That's at foodrevolution.org. And um, then we have campaigns. So, you know, like I said earlier, we want healthy, ethical, sustainable food for all. And so we're always looking at how we can advance that. And so, um, you know, our, our current campaigns are focusing on uh, supporting these programs around prescript produce prescriptions, around double up bucks for SNAP recipients and the fruits and vegetables program. 
We also have campaign objectives to get routine use of antibiotics banned from factory farms. Um, and, um, you know, obviously more things, we're always looking for how can we help basically, you know, mobilize people around these issues. We'd love to see food included in the climate conversation. I know that's super controversial right now, but at the end of the day, it's real. If we want to do something about climate change, we have to change the way we grow our food and the types of foods we consume. And, you know, I'm not a fan of uh, sort of government uh, telling people what to eat or invading people's kitchens or fridges. We don't need food police. But I am a fan of educating people about the impact of their choices so they can make more informed ones. And I am a fan of the government providing some incentive, especially for people who are economically impoverished, to be able to do the right thing for their families and to be on the right side of history. And I think that's just makes sense as a human being who cares about the well-being of my fellow humans. And so um, I think there's creative ways that we can mobilize around that. And at the end of the day, spread the truth, which is that an animal centric diet is an environmental disaster. And when you eat lower on the food chain, you're helping to save water, you're helping to save topsoil, you're helping to save forests and tropical rainforests, you're helping to save the climate for future generations who will live on this planet, and you're creating a more abundant food supply for everybody because it's not so resource intensive to support a plant-based diet. So I think we have some big reasons to move in that direction and I wanna spread the word. I think most people care and wanna do good and wanna be a part of the solution and we're letting them know how. I love that. You know, I, I just want you to know what amazing work you're doing. It's, it's, it's fascinating, you know, how our paths crossed. And I'm just, I, I'm a believer. I, I tell you, you know, the work that you guys are doing, your website, all of the seminars you guys are putting together, it's really powerful stuff. Now, I understand you also wrote a book. It's, it's not like you, you don't have enough to do already. So you have a fascinating book out, The 31 Day Food Revolution. Tell me what, what, inspired you to write it? What's it about? 31 Day Food Revolution is about how you can heal your body and your world with food. And uh, it's what inspired me, first of all, was just sort of, and the title sort of captures this, playing with my grandpa's legacy and saying, well, you know, 31 steps to health in the long run could bring you more pleasure and more joy than 31 flavors of ice cream. And so kind of playing with that theme with the book, uh, so there's 31 chapters, of course, and each chapter ends with simple action steps you can take to apply what you're learning in your life. And 31 Day Food Revolution is divided into four parts. So part one focuses on detoxifying and saying no to the bad stuff and getting the bad stuff out of your kitchen and out of your life and habit change as well. And then part two focuses on nourishing, saying yes to the good stuff. And how do you really saturate your body with the micronutrients and the phytonutrients that will help you thrive? And then part three is gather and it focuses on the social side of food and how we create strong support networks and build healthy food communities. Because, you know, a lot of people feel alone and isolated when they want to eat healthy food. And we're trying to say, look, there's actually ways when you know how to do it, that you can have tons of peer support around your healthy choices. And then part four is transform. And that's where we look at the, the systemic and the global impact of food and how you can really change the world with your knife and fork. And so that's kind of the whole, the whole journey that, that 31 day food revolution takes people on. And, you know, it became a national bestseller and it's certainly reaching some people. And I'm, I'm happy about that and excited to spread the word some more. Um, and, you know, I reached out to you, of course, and let me just put in a word here that um, I'm a Kaiser member and I've been really impressed with some of the things I see Kaiser doing, which I know it's a long road. And I know that in many respects, Kaiser Permanente is part of systems that are much bigger than even, even a company that large. Uh, insurance and government policy and consumer trends that are totally outside of its control. But I also believe that medical providers and insurance providers have some responsibility for the health of human beings. And uh, by starting to lean into healthier choices, by getting rid of sugary sodas from vending machines, by having farmers markets in hospitals, by starting to shift what's served to patients by way of food in the hospitals, by by uh, helping doctors within the Kaiser Permanente network to start to think about food and lifestyle as part of their recommendations, I see some really positive things. I mean, recently I saw my doctor and afterwards I got an automated follow-up email from Kaiser, a survey, right? And it actually asked me if my doctor had asked me about food and health and made any nutritional recommendations. And 
I just thought how cool that, that, that this is a company that actually cares enough to ask a member whether their doctor did that. And clearly it's scoring higher for Kaiser's side if their doctor did. And I don't know how it all gets used on the back end, but to me, even the fact that the Kaiser cares feels really good to me. And so I realized these are small steps, but I started wondering, well, how did this happen? I mean, we've seen the Thrive campaign marketing. And of course we know that that's marketing. It doesn't necessarily translate into action, but I figured there's gotta be somebody in Kaiser who's kind of raising the bar within the whole organization or network of organizations to advocate for some of these things. And so I reached out to Ben, our, our mutual friend, to ask him if he had any ideas and he sent me your way. <laughs> and then we talked and I was like, okay, it's his fault. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, because you really are helping lead the way within the Kaiser ecosystem. And what I just want to say is that um, this matters in a really big way because Kaiser is showing insurers that they should be reimbursing for healthier choices. It's showing providers that they should be recommending diet and lifestyle changes to their patients. And at the end of the day, maybe we can work together to create some systemic change on a broader basis. You know, every, everything starts with how we eat, how we respect the planet. It forms our own identity and there's so much good that we can do. It's not that you don't need medications. It's that you can make the medications so much more effective by just doing basics it's not that you have to be 100% plant-based. It's that there's this rainbow. The more you get to the other side, the more you find more and more benefits. You know, all of these things that people start to say it's black or white, at least in my humble opinion, I find everything gray. And not just gray, I find it all these multicolors and you just got to go wherever you are, whenever you are, however you are, just start. And as you start to make those little tiny changes in your life, the people around you notice they do and they, they start to turn around. And, you know, there's this concept of food shaming, which is quite prevalent. And I know people who are hundred percent vegan, they do it. I know people who are hundred percent carnivores, they do it in every spectrum in between. And what ends up happening is, is people judge you based on how you eat and what you do. Yeah. You know, I'm not running around climbing a tree. What I look at it is, when I first started in my current job, I, I remember I had a patient um, who passed away and uh, I went to see him in the hospital and this is right before he passed. He said, you know, doc, I really should have listened to you. That was his last words to me and he passed that same day. And it haunted me. And it haunted me because I felt like I failed him. What else could I have done? And I kept thinking over and over again. I said, you know, I told him he's got to eat this. I did all of that stuff. And then I realized some of the things that was not what I said, it was how I said it. I didn't make a psychologically safe space. I didn't honor where he was at. I didn't honor the fact that every small victory he had was huge. These are little tiny things. But for everyone who's listening to this today, you know, the, the work ocean that you're doing is changing millions of lives. And for everyone who's watching, get started. And if you're blessed in your life and you're okay financially, support the cause, do more because all of these little things, they matter. And if you only change one person, that one person is all that matters at that moment. It's like that girl who, you know, the story of the starfish on the beach is that same idea, right? Yeah. All those starfish and you're trying to throw one at a time, you'll never get to all of them. But the ones that I'm throwing, it matters. And so, you know, Ocean, I, I, I couldn't be prouder of you. Now, let me, let me ask you an interesting question. And, and I love this. Whenever somebody does something like this, it just, um, there's a special place in my heart for folks like that. You have a pledge that you created. And I really want to hear about that, about when you wrote this book and as the book sales came in, tell me about this pledge of yours. Well, this is actually for every copy of 31 Day Food Revolution. And it's also for every product that Food Revolution Network ever sells, whether it's a course or a, a collection of interviews or any product. We also have a membership program called Whole Life Club. So for every membership renewal, we donate to Trees for the Future so they can plant an organic fruit or nut tree in a low income community. And so, um, you know, I think we, we funded uh, over 100,000 trees last year. and. Um, hopefully more this year. 
Wow. Uh, so we're, uh, we're helping, uh, I think, you know, get, sequester carbon out of the atmosphere and feed people in low income communities uh, by getting more trees planted around the world. And it's, uh, it's, it's a good feeling. Wow. I, I absolutely love that. That is such an amazing thing to do. So thank you. You know, wh- whenever I do these interviews, as we come closer to wrapping things up, I always put people on the spot a little bit and I ask them, I say, okay, so if you had to narrow down everything, you know, and give me your top two, three, four, whatever number it is, but condense it. So people have some actionable steps that they can walk away from. What would you say are your top recommendations? Hmm. Well, um, Number one is to, I, I think I, I covered this kind of earlier with these principles, but I'll also I'll restate it. Number one, eat less sugar and processed junk or none at all. Number two, eat less animal products, especially from factory farms or none at all. Number two, eat more whole plant foods. And number three, source consciously. So pay attention to where your food is coming from who's growing it, who's producing it, and do they, does that align with your values? And the bottom line to all of that is bring your food choices into alignment with what you really want for your life and what, what you really want for your world. When you do that, your life t- takes on an integrity, a potency, a strength, and a dynamism that's tremendous. You know, when you, when you feed your body junk food, it erodes your self-esteem, it erodes your dignity, it erodes, your, it erodes your sense of integrity. When, when you feed your body food that you know is detrimental to the world around you and you take that into your own body, it, it eats away at the soul just a little bit. And by the same token, when you feed your body healthy food that you know is good for you, you're sending love to your cells. You're sending love to your body. And you're, when you eat food that is, that is consciously produced in alignment with your values, you're kind of writing a love letter to the world saying, I care about you. I care about farm workers. I care about animals. I care about ecosystems. And I want to be a part of the solution on planet Earth. And so when you do that, there's a feeling of dignity and love and integrity and coherence that lands in your body that you could never measure in a nutritional facts label. But I say it's real. I say it matters. And I say when you make those kinds of choices, you'll feel better about yourself and you will see the world as a brighter and a more beautiful place because you'll be a part of making it so. That is beautifully said. Thank you, my friend, for coming on the show with us today. You are an absolute delight, a wealth of knowledge. God bless you for the amazing work that you're doing. And I can't wait to work together with you on lots of projects to change the world one starfish at a time. Yes, absolutely. So grateful to be here. And for everybody watching, thank you for your time and your attention and for your partnership in the food revolution. Let's do this.